I just want to thank um, Dr. Alphonse Pomp and uh, Alex Nagel for this kind uh, invitation. So, you know, the world of uh, endoluminal um, bariatric surgery is always changing, and uh, you know, the um, updates are going to be very um, interesting to see here in the future. H here are my disclosures. Uh, we will not be talking about any devices from uh, these two companies. So the, the key thing we want to look at for endoscopic um, bariatric surgery are the primary endoluminal uh, proce procedures that we do today, the revisional endoluminal procedures that we can do today, and also some new technology. And I think the, the key thing here is new technology, and I think we're going to change the way we think of uh, weight loss surgery in the future. So when you look at uh, primary uh, procedures, basically there are three mechanisms, the uh, gastric balloons or intragastric occupying devices, uh, and the luminal sleeves, and the sleeves differ on where the sleeves are anchored, and, and a new uh, thought uh, process, and the luminal stent for weight loss. So when you, when you do an overview of the balloons, there are multiple different balloons that are available throughout the world, but not in the uh, U.S. Uh, currently, there are uh, four different balloons, uh, the bib, the uh, helisphere, uh, endogas, and the spats balloon. A meta-analysis of, uh, of the bib uh, data throughout the world, IMES did a study looking at uh, 15 different uh, reports, 3,442 patients, 0.8% obstruction, 0.1% um, perforation. Two patients died from insertions of these um, space-occupying devices. 4% had to be removed before the six-month period, and about a 32% excess body weight loss at six months. So um, for, for an operation that's temporary to get patients to maybe lose weight before surgery or maybe um, get them to lose weight enough to improve their type 2 diabetes. Uh, looking at one type of balloon, the SPATS balloon, it's a fully adjustable intragastric balloon, so much like maybe an adjustable gastric band, you can now go in there and uh, endoscopically adjust the, uh, the size of the balloon to give you more weight loss. And at, uh, with 18 patients in a 12-month pilot study, uh, they had 50% excess body weight loss for about 26 uh, kilograms. We're going to kind of shift gears now and talk about the uh, duodenal jejunal bypass sleeve. Uh, basically, this device is anchored in the um, duodenal bulb. Uh, this is what the anchoring device looks like in a uh, floral uh, picture of it. You can kind of see the sleeve go through the uh, first portion of the small bowel here. A recent analysis in 2013 by uh, Patel et al. looking at non-systemic reviews worldwide, articles published on this um, uh, device. Uh, most studies used a 12-week excess weight loss um, as their primary outcome measures and results ranging from uh, published studies throughout the world from 11.9% to about 23.6%. One study had uh, follow-up at 52 weeks looking at excess uh, weight loss at 47% uh, excess weight loss. Uh, another study here in 2013, 17 obese patients uh, with type 2 diabetes received the um, duodenal jejunal bypass sleeve, and at 24 weeks after implantation, the average weight loss was 12.7 uh, kilograms. What was significant about this paper was the hemoglobin A1C had improved from 8.4 down to 7.0, uh, which was uh, significant in the study, and both fasting glucose levels and the postprandial glucose response uh, were decreased at one week and remained uh, decreased at the 24-week uh, period while the sleeves were in. So we're seeing some uh, evidence that maybe uh, traditional non-surgical approaches can actually improve type 2 diabetes here. Uh, and these are other studies looking at the uh, duodenal ju jejunal bypass sleeve within the last uh, year. Now we're going to uh, kind of shift, shift our focus here. You know, if you put a sleeve and bypass the duodenum into the first portion of the small bowel, what if you bypass the uh, stomach and the uh, first portion of the small bowel? Your results should uh, hopefully be better here. Looking at the gastrodigenal the the bypass sleeve, prospective single trial study uh, was undertaken. The device was used as a unique uh, gastrodigenal the the bypass sleeve secured to the uh, esophageal gastric junction with endoscopic and laparoscopic techniques. And it was designed to create an endoluminal gastrodigenal uh, jejunal bypass, and the endpoints were 
uh, safety and adverse events, percentage excess body weight loss, changes in uh, core morbidities, and the change in hemoglobin A1C. From February 2008 to 2010, 24 patients had, were enrolled. 22 patients had the device in for uh, the entire time, Sem or 17 patients maintained the device for the 12-week uh, uh, trial. The excess body weight loss at 12 weeks was 39.7%. Seven patients with uh, preoperative type 2 diabetes all had normal blood glucose levels throughout the trial, and none required their antihypoglycemic or hyperglycemic medications throughout the trial. All four patients with elevated hemoglobin A1Cs uh, had uh, normal levels or had improvement at the end of the trial, and no patients, uh, no patient safety uh, um, um, complications were reported, and no adverse effects were uh, really reported except for uh, nausea, and those all improved after the endoscopic devices were removed. Um, now we're going to kind of shift gears from the sleeves um, and talk about something called an endoluminal stent. So. You know, uh, much of us today uh, who are doing sleeve gastrectomies are, are looking at stenting to uh, help us with some uh, horrific problems that we can see after sleeve gastrectomy. But now, um, a surgeon named uh, Randall Baker from uh, Michigan uh, came up with a device that looks like a, an, an alumina stent. It's called a full sense device. And basically what it is, is a, it looks like an upside down funnel. It's placed in the esophagus. It's secured into the, uh, uh, the gastric wall by suturing it in place. Uh, both endoscopically and laparoscopically. The first trials were done with laparoscopic uh, suturing of the stent in place. Uh, the, the new devices are now actually placed uh, inside the uh, distal esophagus and proximal stomach and actually endoscopically sutured in place. Uh, here's a laparoscopic view of the device and you can see it, it kind of increases the, uh, the fundus and keeps it uh, uh, opened up there. So how does this stent device work? But uh, basically it puts pressure on the distal esophagus and proximal stomach causing satiety and resulting weight loss. The device evokes a neurohormone or humoral response associated with fullness and uh, augments and amplifies normal feeling cessation of the stomach. I think the main advantages of the device is it's reversible, uh, can be placed um, uh, with minimally invasive uh, endoscopic techniques and it can uh, be maintained in the, in the G-junction and maintain the G-junction function. So this is a very interesting uh, trial. So I just actually talked to the, uh, the surgeons who actually did this trial about an hour ago. And their update on this trial, uh, they had 15 patients enrolled in this trial. And at uh, about six months or 27 weeks, they had 74.9% excess body weight loss. So that is a remarkable number. If you look at uh, gastric bypass and sleeve gastrectomy, it will compete with that operation here in the near future. They have since then done a, go back on, they have since done a, a, a crossover a trial and a randomized prospective trial in, in patients and those results are not out yet. Now we're gonna uh, change our focus now from primary endoluminal um, bariatric operations to endoluminal revisional surgery. Uh, at the ASMBS uh, Emerging Technology and Procedures Committee uh, group, we came out with a white paper and just, just got published. Basically, our statement is uh, there are multiple methods of endoluminal intervention for weight regain that uh, were reviewed throughout the um, world, ranging from injections of inert substance to suturing and clipping. Uh, the majority of the literature is limited to small case series most of these reviews devices are unfortunately no longer available on the market. Uh, endoluminal therapy represents an intriguing strategy for weight regain um, after room wide gastric bypass, and the current and future technologies must be rigorously studied and improved uh, in such that they offer uh, long term, durable, repeatable, and cost effective solutions. Uh, with that statement, uh, we're going to talk about a few things that are on the market today. So endoluminal revisional procedures probably is the, um, the one thing we really haven't um, conquered right now in surgery. There's a, there's a vast amount of research going on. Uh, when you look at injections with sodium uh, morate, four large studies with really marginal results, unfortunately these injections have to be repeated. And basically the, uh, 
um, outcomes of the paper and conclusions are it can stabilize weight regain. What's off the market right now uh, that has previously been on the market, Stomofix, Rose, and the uh, Togo procedure. And uh, fortunately, there is only one device that is left on the market right now that we still can study, the uh, overstitch device. So basically what it is is an endoscopic suturing um, system. And uh, what it is is uh, you use a, uh, a scope with, uh, with two channels. You place the device on the scope, and if you look at the, if you look at the end uh, effector of the endoscope, it's a suturing arm that basically passes the suture back and forth, you know, much like a, a, an endo stitch would pass the suture back and forth here. So you can endoscopically suture or reapproximate um, um, tissue back together here. So this device can be used for uh, multiple purposes. Uh, Chris Thompson from Harvard uh, looked at 22 patients. He did 11 outlet reductions and 11 out outlet and pouch reductions with uh, uh, six patients having uh, complications, uh, which includes stenosis, uh, GI bleed, and retching. And at six months, or excuse me, at three months, he had 27.5 pound weight loss for 21.5% excess body weight loss. Another study that was presented he, uh, here at SAGES last year, uh, Dr. Uh, Galvalo and his colleagues from uh, Brazil, 15 patients, status post-gastric bypass, underwent stoma reduction. Um, at 12 months, he had 61% regain weight loss uh, from this procedure and no complications. And, and this is one of uh, Dr. Galvalo's video that he uh, let me use for this talk here. So basically, he is coming down with the overstitch device, this patient who's uh, status post-gastric bypass. And what uh, they're attempting to do is to do a stomal reduction by suturing. Basically, he places the suture on one side, and his goal is to get the uh, stomal down to um, about eight millimeters or less here on, on these reductions. And the uh, cartoon picture on the left here shows that the uh, Basically, the device grabs the um, wall of the stomach on one side here. And you can see the before and after uh, pictures of it. Here's the before. And the uh, after image here. You can see a, a dramatic reduction uh, in the size of the stoma. And the last thing I want to talk about is the new technology that we're working on at uh, The Ohio State University. We are actually doing, undergoing a study called deep brain stimulation. So it's been around for um, um, many years. In uh, neurosurgery, they use deep brain stimulation for patients with um, Parkinson's disease. So uh, a neurosurgeon, uh, Dr. Razai at Ohio State University and our colleagues, um, Brad Needham and myself, we're undergoing a study looking at uh, five patients that are at least two years out with a body mass index of greater than 40 um, after having room wide gastric bypass. Uh, the patients will be followed for two years. And the way it works is um, in their brain, you have three areas that are responsible for uh, appetite. The lateral hypothalamus is responsible for appetite. The uh, ventral medial hypothalamus is responsible for, for satiety. And the uh, nucleus uh, accumbens is responsible for the reward sensation that you get when you eat high uh, sweets or high fat foods and sweets. So we're going to block the neural sensation to these patients so that they don't um, have the craving for uh, high fat foods and sweets. So it's undergoing right now, we're in active enrollment and he is very confident. He's probably done about a thousand deep brain simulations for Parkinson's disease. There is literature out in the neurosurgery world that this will work and we're quite, very excited to be part of this study. Uh, and in conclusion, I think uh, there are promising primary procedures under Horizon and the luminal revisional procedure for weight regain must be studied and improved such that we offer um, durable and cost-effective outcomes. Um, diabetes control may be the main target for these procedures, and I think neuromodulation neuromod with deep brain stimulation may change uh, the way we treat obesity in the future. Thank you very much. Thank you. So Definitely endoluminal once we're sticking electrodes into your brain. Yeah, I um, thought that was endoluminal because we go through okay, the Okay, no, I'm fine. Uh, <laughs> Dean, I've seen you do things. You're an excellent endoscopist. How good do you have to be as an endoscopist to start deploying 
uh, these uh, duodenal, jejunal, or gastroduodenal tubes. So, you know, it's, it's much like uh, placing a, a stent. So if you have a lot of esophageal stenting, it's basically a, a guide wire um, over, um, and you place the, uh, the sleeves over the guide wire. So uh, with some training, um, surgeons who do a lot of endoscopy tend to have an easier time doing these procedures, but um, as surgeons, folks can all do them. As Dr. Kakuda pointed out, people are thinking that maybe the restrictive procedures are not the best procedures we have. So what do you think if we're just reducing the lumen, you're, aren't you just creating a different problem and people will go to high caloric uh, liquidy type foods if they gain weight in the back? Is, yeah. this, is this in any way going to be durable? Sure. Opinion, I, not fact. Opinion is, um, you know, I, I think uh, on these patients, any kind of additional restriction will, will help them out. They want to be restricted to the point they, they throw up. And a lot of these surgeons are getting them to that point. So I think they need a negative feedback mechanism. And, uh, and hopefully in the future we can uh, change their behaviors by maybe modulating some other factors like their brain. Uh, yes. Okay, one question from the uh, Who is doing this uh, procedure, the uh, surgeon or endoscopist? Because this point is very important for us as surgeons because we are seeing in uh, around the world many people doing endoluminal surgery and they are not surgeons and then the complications they cannot deal with. So, that, so, so the question that. is from our distinguished colleague from Kuwait and it's really, uh, so should this be a surgical or should we allow the GI docs to add it? So in, in the U.S. it's um, mainly surgeons uh, throughout the world I see it's more um, gastroenterologists. So I, I think that's a good study right there. We see the outcomes that we have in the U.S. with surgeons and see the outcomes that we have throughout the world with uh, gastroenterologists. Thanks a lot. Thank you very much. Dean. So